Hello everybody. So once again, I am at the San Francisco Botanical Gardens. I got here today a little bit late because I was talking with a really interesting uh, homeless guy who's a painter and an actor um, outside the gardens. And when I got to the gardens, they were already closed um, for what they call a, a solstice lantern walk, which we may be encountering. Um, people from. Uh, so they wouldn't let me in the gardens, but I know a lot about the gardens. <laughs> So, I'm in the gardens, even though I was late. And today, uh, the winter solstice, the long darkness, but also a midpoint, a between point, an important between point in, in uh, the time cycles of Earth and her relationships with other celestial bodies, particularly the Sun. Uh, and I'm going eventually today to be talking about memory and one thing we can probably easily understand about all of the incredible profound beauty of the living world is that all living beings can be conceived of as a form of physical memory. Now, of course, there's, there's much more going on than merely recording. All of these beings are sharing in each other's experiences and presence, origin, all of these beautiful beings on earth the insects, the animals, the water beings, the sky beings the tiny organisms that comprise animals and plants they're all together comprising a unity and I don't want to compare that unity to a brain because I think that's an insufficient comparison. But memory is very magical stuff. And indeed, without what we refer to as memory, we would not have minds. <laughs> we certainly would not have language. This looks to me like a, like a coyote dig, probably. Something else might have dug this hole. Mm, conceivably a raccoon or a skunk, but I think it was a coyote. In order to think that, I have to refer back to all kinds of previous experiences. In fact, I have to be able to formulate concepts and ideas in language, which means that I have to remember all of the ways in which that, that is done, and I have to remember how that whole process originated in my life. So I will be talking today about memory. 
but I just want to touch briefly on the idea that the living forms are, while they are like memory in some ways, they are more, much more than memory. They are meta-memory. Yeah. They're a kind of superposition over memory that is itself alive. Now, all of these words are quite suspect. Um, they are attempts to capture qualities, relationships, forms, ideas, senses of things, our words. And so they fall far short of direct experience in relation. <clears throat> they are toys. And too often, we take the words to so seriously that we become blind to that toward which they point. Yet, we have the capacity to become aware of that and to unlearn it. Yeah? We can become aware of the strange obstacle our, our words and our names comprise for us. And with that awareness, we can see through it. Perhaps into the essence and origin of beings and minds and the universe. And I know that this is possible because I have had this experience. So it's not merely a theory that I have. These living forms are like the physical meta-memory of the living earth. If she has something more than a mind, and I believe this to be so because again I have experienced it, then these are the organs of her mind. And when they prosper, she prospers. And when they suffer, she suffers. And when they die, she forgets, perhaps forever. And the earth has suffered many extinction events in which nearly all the complex organisms suddenly, unexpectedly perished. And for a being, a superorganism or a being that is a world, which I, I think we need a class in our language that is above beings. Ordinarily, this is occupied by the divine beings or by gods. But we need a word in English that <clears throat> points at meta beings. And I think the earth and the sun and the moon and the planets, these are likely to be meta beings, particularly though I would include the sun and the earth. Um, though I suspect that all of the phenomenon in, in space time have such qualities. So the earth must have suffered extinction events and when she did, <clears throat> um, if, if indeed time is linear the way that we think about it, and I have good reason to suspect it is not, I, I suspect that time is nonlinear and our relationship with it imposes linearity on our perception of time. But in the human ideas about linear time, and given what, we, what we've learned from paleontology and science, and geology, the Earth has suffered extinction events. And for her, those events must have been like strokes. One moment, she had a, 
unimaginably sophisticated mind. Trillions of diverse organisms in astonishing symbiotic relationships. <clears throat> the next moment, nothing. And I wonder if in those moments what was left of her called out to her relations for help. Just as I might call out for help if I could muster the ability if I were badly injured or if I had a stroke but was still conscious. So, if the living forms are analogous but meta to the mind of this world, then when they are obliterated or replaced by machines, her mind disappears. And I think our minds are children of these phenomenon. though we participate in them and perhaps represent a peculiar feature of Earth's cognition. <clears throat> a peculiar organ in the more than a mind that the living world is the evidence of the can be understood to be the evidence of the existence of yeah. and so these living forms we see are memory but they are not merely storage they are memory come to life and we moderns are unfortunate as it as relates to our understandings of memory because the metaphors that we were that have replaced what once may have been our understanding of memory those metaphors are mechanical and uh, the analogy the modern analogy of of memory is what we do inside computer chips and storage devices and things like that so <clears throat> We've come to associate memory with merely, with mere storage. And that is not the nature of memory at all. For silicon does not dream. And if you do not dream, your memory is damaged and may even collapse. In fact, studies uh, demonstrated that in animals that were kept from dreaming, uh, first of all, learning declined precipitously. Their capacity to learn declined catastrophically. But then over a very short period of time, I think um, five to seven days of no dreaming, uh, and I guess researchers who can be very cruel to living things um, found a way to always interrupt the dreaming of the test organisms. Those organisms lost the capacity to control their body temperature and died. Silicon doesn't die if it doesn't dream because it wasn't alive to begin with. And it doesn't, there are no minds in silicon, let's be clear about this. These analogies that we make between the brain and the computer are nonsensical. They're they're simply wrong. <laughs> it doesn't mean that we can't, <clears throat> that there's no useful uh, purpose in analogizing certain activities with computation. For example, um, I can perform with my mind. Uh, one of the things I can do is, is mathematics. I can do mathematical operations. I can add two integers and get a sum. But that is not computation. Computation is a derivation of the, of the ability of a mind 
to engage in mathematical activity. But no mind that ever existed when it did mathematical activity did only that, right? A mind was a very complex thing. Some small aspect of the mind engaged in mathematical activity. And so minds, even when they are performing computations, are superpositions of computation, right? They are vastly beyond mere computation, even when they're doing that. And they have to be in order to do that. And bizarrely, this was kind of proven by Einstein's, one of Einstein's best friends, perhaps his, his best friend, Kurt Gödel, in his uh, theorems on incompleteness, on the incompleteness of formal systems. And without going into too much detail, for formal systems to be accurate, they have to be incomplete. If they are perfectly complete, they will fail to produce reliable results. And one of the conjectures about that theory is that this is because for theories to work at all, there have to be minds interpreting them, <laughs> right? And you cannot put the mind in the math. The math can happen in the mind, but the mind cannot happen in the math. <laughs> now here is something that I saw a few days ago and filmed in a previous video. It now looks rather benign, but it is the regurgitated remnants of an organism that was probably being digested by a coyote. <clears throat> because it's hard for me to imagine another animal who could have uh, swallowed something that size. <laughs> now memory is deeply mysterious and we will never understand everything about it because of course our understanding itself relies upon memory to, to assemble form and analogy and structure and and often humans understand things by analogizing to another thing which is already understood and this creates a tree-like structure that has very pro profound roots there are root elements to human cognition um, so far as I know these have remained largely undiscovered and undiscussed I call them holophores um, to understand what anything is, you have to have some idea what the world is, right? That's, that's a holophore, the world, or what reality is, what everything is, right? That's another root element. To understand what a tree is, you first must understand the context in which, from which you dis distinguish a tree, yeah? And, and the tree inherits qualities from that context, so in, in human knowledge and ideas, we have these root elements that I like to think, <laughs> well, I discovered them for myself. Perhaps others have discovered them. I am unaware of them. If so, it seems modest, at least modestly likely that others, others have realized they exist, these holophores, these roots, without which human knowledge cannot exist and upon which it depends and upon which its character and, and content depend. Because all of the things that we distinguish inherit qualities from our idea of what everything is. So for example, if the physicists think that everything is the result of the Big Bang, then the universe to them takes on that likeness and all of the phenomenon within it acquire, inherit characteristics from that origin event. Yeah. And if the Christians think this is a world created by God, then everything within the world inherits this quality. Yeah. Whatever you think the everything is will determine qualities and characteristics of all of the sub derivations, right? All of the things you distinguish. 
And language is particularly strange in this way and quite astonishing. Now, of course, to use language at all, we must awaken our memories. And part of the reason why I'm speaking on memory today <clears throat> is because I had a peculiar... I'm, first of all, I'm really fascinated with two, two features of my experience as a living being. I mean, I'm fascinated with <laughs> thousands of things. But these two things um, really astonish me. One of them is that we have memory at all, that we can remember anything, that memory exists. And the other is that we dream. And today, as I was walking and thinking about the solstice on my way to the gardens, I... uh, I was trying to remember what my friend told me they call the sun in Blackfoot. And I knew the second word, Natotsi, if I got it right. But I could not remember the first word, which mean which I think means something similar to old man. And while I was unable to remember that first word and while I was searching for it in in my (laughs) while I was striving in my memory to recall it I suddenly realized that while I was walking down the street struggling to remember something I felt as if I might be dreaming and then suddenly I had this insight that perhaps what we call formal memory requires that we dream to assemble and sustain it. And thus memory could be understood as the skeletal remains of activities performed by the dreaming mind both while we sleep and in a, in a variety of perhaps unique forms while we are awake. And this idea deeply fascinates me because dreaming and memory are unimaginably mysterious <clears throat> and profound. Why should it be that each night When we sleep, worlds appear within our minds and we have experiences possible and impossible, profound experiences that have dimensions of meaning that it is extremely uncommon our waking experience can approach. So that the activities of our minds in dreaming <clears throat> have what I would uh, suggest are extra dimensions of meaning that our ordinary waking experience does not usually have. Well, some of us have had daydreams, and perhaps some few of us have actually dreamed while awake. Some of those of us who profess to have experienced psychic phenomenon will be likely to, if if asked, may tell us that the faculties they are familiar with in dreaming are involved in their experience of non-ordinary cognition or non-local cognition. We do not have to believe any story about psychism or there not being psychism to unchers. There are non-ordinary features of human cognition where minds link and ordinary boundaries are crossed. 
by our consciousness. We don't have to believe any specific description to understand that these things happen. <clears throat> Nor do we have to disbelieve any specific description. Consciousness is, is still very mysterious and our capacity to explore it with it, because that's what you have to do. If you want to explore consciousness, you've got to use consciousness to explore consciousness. You know, it's relatively hard to see your eye with your eye. And we have the same kind of problem with consciousness and perhaps also with memory and with dreaming. <clears throat> now, people's ability to remember dreams varies widely and it may vary throughout their lifetime. Some people remember dreams very easily. Others almost never remember them. Some can remember many dreams throughout a night, others only a few. This may differ from night to night or age to age or season to season. But the relationship between dreaming and memory is fundamentally profound. And I think that I noticed accidentally something today that very much surprised me. That when I was in the experience of not being able to remember a word and I was searching for that word in my mind, suddenly I felt this is like I am dreaming. This searching in my memory reminds me of dreaming. And I would ask that you recall earlier in my exploration, in my reflections today, <clears throat> that I mentioned that even in science we have discovered an extremely profound link between the necessity of dreaming and the maintenance of memory. Now, certainly, without memory, we have no identity. Eh? So you would still have a biological identity if you had no mind and no memory, but you would have no conscious identity so that who you are and how you think and feel and see and, and remember your life and the world. By the way, these are salvia plants and you can take one of these and pull it from the little sheaf. Yeah. And if you just put this part in your mouth and suck on this, nectar will come out, which I'm going to do right now. Mm. Oh my goodness. That one. <laughs> and that one had a lot of nectar in it. And one might imagine that that nectar and that all of this biological phenomenon around me, all of these beings and their relationships, that nectar is the memory of both sunlight and darkness. Well, we could say, we could say many things about what it is the memory of. It is not merely these two things. For example, it is the, these, are, these organisms remember and represent the origin and potential of life on Earth, the entire history of life on Earth. From the first moment that life either landed or emerged on this planet or arose here to now, all of these living things are the children of that first instant. They are its living memory. Now, as I was saying, if you, if you were to be without memory, you would be without identity. Your identity as a consciousness would disappear. Now, I wonder if any of you have had the waking experience of the disappearance of your identity or some other experience of the disappearance of your identity, even momentarily. I have had this experience in a couple of different versions. One of them happened in a unexpected shift in consciousness that happened when I closed my eyes as a teenager. <clears throat> 
and I forgot what everything was suddenly. I could hear voices around me, but I could not understand them. I did not know where or what I was. Suddenly, for a moment, my memory changed its nature, and I could no longer interpret sensory phenomenon the way that I ordinarily do. Another experience where I lost my identity was during a, uh, an event that we refer to as sleep paralysis. And after having experienced this extremely troubling and strange phenomenon, I became profoundly curious about it. And I decided that the next time that it would happen, I would not fight it. I would, I would release myself into it, even though it feels like one will die. And when I did, which wasn't very long after making that decision, maybe a few a month or so later, <clears throat> I awoke, so to speak, paralyzed, blind, and unable to, to breathe. Uh, I decided to let go. And when I did that, something inexplicable happened. I seemed my consciousness seemed to rise up out of my body through the top of my head and become a completely other kind of thing which was a hmm, which is extremely difficult to describe in language but it was like i was um, an invisible snake-like being in a black expanse i was moving sinuously like a snake moves that movement was ecstasy and it felt all these things. It was, first of all, it was impossible to think in that state. There was no thinking and there was no memory of humanity or language or Darren or anything like that in that state. None. I had no, no relationship whatsoever with any previous identity or knowledge or memory I might've had. Instead, what I had was this ecstatic capacity to move. And it seemed as though because I moved this way, all movement was. It seemed as though this moving I became was the cause of all movement. And it was like being a god. It was like being the god of movement. But there wasn't anything to remember. And it was an ecstatic feeling. And it became more ecstatic each time I moved, or, or as I moved, as I swayed. But I had no body, there was nothing to see, there was no temperature, there were no other beings, there were no ideas. There was just this ecstatic movement. And memory was gone. <laughs> and then a short time later, I returned to my, it seemed I, that, that I, I fell or was drawn back from this possible superposition over consciousness back into my body and my identity and I was astonished but for a time I had been without uh, I had been I'd had awareness of some form but without memory and thus without identity and also without ideas without language without knowledge And language and knowledge and ideas and concepts and models and descriptions and explanations, these are all the structured children of memory. And perhaps memory, <laughs> you can imagine if a wave arriving on a beach as it departs left like a venous structure. Huh? The water is formless, but its departure creates a structure. And this may be one way to imagine the relationship with or between dreaming as the wave and memory as the structure that remains in the wake of its departing, which we actually call awakening. <laughs> awakening. I'm gonna pause for a moment 
to read a comment by Tim. He speaks of uh, remembering the arrival, quote unquote, of an understanding of identity when it clarified that he was Tim around age four. And <laughs> I think it's really fascinating and important that we recall the peculiar uh, cognitive and imaginal adventures, the cognitive and imaginal adventures of our childhood. Because when we were children, we had not yet developed the highly structured forms of memory, ideation, cognition, and language that, that we may acquire as adults. And so, as children, I think we were creatures of the dream, and I believe, like fish swimming in water, <laughs> if water is the dreaming, we were What we refer to as the imagination of children <clears throat> is actually their capacity to experience the dreaming mind while awake. And this uh, we can see the evidence of in their, in their speech and in their play. Yeah? They can still dream while awake, but as we grow older, most of us, our minds become too structured to freely allow that. And so perhaps we chase it yeah? in some way. We, we want to recover that feeling of dreaming while, awake, while we're awake, that feeling of playful, creative relation with possibility and sensation and the mind, the consciousness. So perhaps we may take drugs, unfortunately. I think generally, unfortunately. For there are other better ways to bring dreaming to life while we are awake. And the drugs mostly have profound costs. Now, of course, <clears throat> um, I'm sure many of the, the people who will watch this video have either um, considered taking psychedelics or have taken psychedelics, a particular class of drug that induces uh, profound non-ordinary experiences of consciousness. And many people um, advocate the use of these drugs. Uh, and some people present them as a portal to awakening or enlightenment. Um, my personal perspective is that this is very dangerous. Uh, additionally, having known hundreds of people who've done psychedelic drugs, I've known approximately zero who actually experienced some kind of significant awakening. And I've known a good 10 or 15 people who've had extremely severe um, bad outcomes from that, some of which were relatively permanent. So I feel very cautious about suggesting that psychedelic drugs are a way for adults to dream while awake or to partly experience the return of the dreaming mind while awake. Yet, at the same time, I would acknowledge there is some degree of similarity um, between the experience of psychedelic drugs and the capacity to dream while awake. A degree of similarity. And different drugs are different. Um, they're not all the same thing, even though we refer to them as a class. But I have had experiences of dreaming while awake. Two in particular that really stand out as an adult. Um, one of them was an accident that occurred uh, during a hypnotic experiment with another person. And 
the result of that accident was that while I was awake, I was having three to four, well, three to seven maybe dreams per minute that would just suddenly emerge into my consciousness fully formed but not tagged as a dream, tagged as an experience I'd actually had, just as if I, you know, tried to remember holding my phone and making this video. So dreams were bubbling up while I was conscious, fully formed. I didn't have to, tr I did not have to go from the beginning of the dream to the end. They, they arrived fully formed and yet appeared to have a a unique form of temporality associated with them. And this was a staggeringly shocking experience for me and actually terrifying because I was afraid that I might have broken my mind. <laughs> I did not know whether this phenomenon would ever stop. And one thing I regret about it is that I did not record any of those dreams because I was so astonished and unsettled by what was happening that it, it didn't occur to me <laughs> that it would be really profound to have records of some of them. So over the next maybe 48 hours, I experienced hundreds of dreams while I was awake. And of course I fell asleep and had dreams while I was asleep, but I woke up and this was still going on. And over about 48 hours, that phenomenon faded. So I know that it is possible to create a state, perhaps um, using trance, uh, where someone can dream while they are awake. They can have both the, the experience of being conscious and in a, in a specific place, and also at that same time be dreaming, and then those dreams will bubble up like fully formed worldlets in their consciousness. And that was an amazing experience that I really feel lucky to have had. But I've had another experience of dreaming while awake very recently where um, I was visiting a friend uh, in the mountains above San Bernardino and I knew that I was going to a lake and I was very excited to get into that lake with my body. And the night before I'd had a fairly, I'd had both a nightmare and a very profound dream. And the next day when I got into the lake fully awake. As I recovered from the cold shock, I began, two things happened at once. I began dreaming while I was in the water, but the dreaming was not, huh, how to put it? It was like the essence of dreaming rather than having a dream. Yeah? And simultaneously, Dreams that I'd had the previous night, including the nightmare and the profound dream, and some other dreams I had not remembered, began flowing into my consciousness suddenly. So I was having this really complex experience of, of being in my waking mind, swimming in the water of a lake, recalling the previous night's dreams as though they were happening again, and experiencing something like the essence of dreaming. And I was overjoyed. I was so excited because I knew that, uh, by the way, before I got into the lake, I took a more than a moment. I took time to really connect with that place and to give it my reverence and my respect. This wasn't like a playtime activity of, oh, I want to go swimming. This was, this was, a, this was a sacred activity of, I want to meet the living waters of this place with reverence and awe. I want to join with them. Yeah. And there's a, there's a wonderful analogy between liquescence, between water and dreaming. I think perhaps our minds are the result of things that happened when we were children where we would have experiences in the daytime 
Our memories were not yet fully structured. In fact, there may have been a time when they were highly unstructured. We would dream at night, the waters would come, and in the daytime, the waters would depart and there'd be a little tiny piece of structure there. And then we would dream again, and the waters would depart and the structure would have grown slightly. But then, someday there was a time when the waters no longer came in the daytime at all. They only came at night. And during the daytime, mostly what we experienced was the structure. And that would be identity. That would be formal memory. That would be the kind of systematic cognition we're familiar with as adults. I think I'd be remiss if I did not at least introduce the impossibly sophisticated topic of imagination here. Uh, So in the word itself, there is encoded image making, right? Imagi. Um, which we could playfully dissect into I, and maybe even I, not just I, Darren, but I, I, the magi, right? I, the magician. And, and magician has the same, you know, phoneme, right? It's very difficult to speak eloquently about imagination because, again, it's, it's what, <laughs> without it, there isn't anything. <laughs> you can't put language together, you can't understand words or concepts or even distinguish things without using both your memory and your imagination. And of course when we dream, whatever it is we're pointing at with this word imagination, and I think (laughs) it's very poorly defined at best (laughs) because there's something profound that escapes all definitions about memory and imagination and dreaming. Uh, but when we're dreaming the imagination is free of the constraints that being awake places on it and some of those constraints are physical there's a trunk of nerves that is controlled by the left hemisphere which is generally associated with the right side of the body and the left hemisphere is has a primary role in our understanding and use of language, concepts. There's a trunk of nerves that that run from the left hemisphere and control the, the sort of flow of fuel to the right hemisphere. And when we fall asleep, this lock slips away. And when we awaken, it, it is reforged. And so it's as if while awake, one, one way we might think of it, perhaps it's too prosaic, is that the left hemisphere, while we are awake, uh, takes the right hemisphere prisoner. <laughs> and it's like, um, if we imagine it this way, if we choose to, it's a bit like the story, The Man in the Iron Mask, where there's a bad king who has a prisoner in the dungeon in an iron mask because that prisoner is his twin. And that prisoner would be a good king and was perhaps once a good king, Um, but now is trapped. And when we are children, both sovereigns exist while we are awake. But as we become adults, as we grow up, for most of us, there are some of us are exceptional and we manage to preserve some aspects of the dreaming twin in our waking consciousness, sometimes as play or creativity or humor, sometimes as uh, non-ordinary cognition, things we might conceive of as potentially psychic. Um, Although both hemispheres are involved in all activity and, you know, in, in nearly all of our activity. And You know, although in neuroscience we look at the brain and see what lights up during certain kinds of behaviors, it's very important to understand that the brain is extremely sophisticated and in order to produce 
the results, the the capabilities that it that it demonstrates. It's a dance not just of activation but of inhibition. In order for some experiences to be possible, we we don't merely energize some parts of the brain. We have to turn off others. And this is probably why we very rarely dream while awake. Now, as I recall, in Greek mythology, mnemosyne, from which we get the word mnemonic, um, mnemosyne was the mother of the muses. And I do not remember all of the muses' names or their domains of um, primacy. I remember one of the names is Terpsichore. Um, but memory was the mother of the arts of consciousness. And some of the domains of primacy were things like epic poetry, lyric poetry, music, um, perhaps philosophy, um, arts of the imagination. Yeah? Mnemosyne, or memory, was the mother of the muses. Now, of course, it should be obvious, without memory, you have nothing. You, have, you cannot really, you can have awareness, right? But you can't have consciousness as we experience and understand it. You certainly cannot have language. Right? You, you would be unable to... And there's, and there's so many different features of memory involved in the things that we take for granted. Like just being, like walking or understanding a sentence or composing a sentence. right? Because we don't have to just remember what words are. We have to remember how to compose language. <laughs> right? So memory has all these um, astonishing little backwaters and features that we ordinarily are never inclined to think of, to remember. <laughs> it's not surprising that the Greeks deified memory. For without memory, there is no culture. Now, in our modern time, I think we have suffered a cataclysmic deprivation, an impoverishment. Because we now depend on devices to remember things for us. When I first came to the Bay Area, I worked for a man, Mansour Asadi at a printing house. And I've always been fascinated by, by different features of memory and try to practice memory arts in various ways. Mansour had a peculiar capability that he must have developed in his youth. I don't think it came naturally to him. If he heard a phone number, he remembered it. So he did not need a phone book. <laughs> right? He could hear a phone number one time, link it to the person that it belonged to and remember it. And I thought that was pretty amazing. I don't know if he had a technique. Some people who have astonishing memories utilize techniques. And long ago there were techniques like memory palaces where you would associate things you wanted to remember with specific locations in a building or a place, perhaps like this garden, a place very familiar to one. And those techniques are fascinating and useful. But we must imagine that before we had, before we could depend on technology uh, to replace our own memories, including the technology of writing, our minds and memories must have been astonishingly different. It's in general, like their capacities must have been profound. And I try to be careful for example, not to use an online thes thesaurus when I'm looking for a word. 
not to just Google something, <laughs> which is such a strange thing to say. Not to Google something that I can recall with a bit of effort. I don't use the internet. I, you know, the internet is, is a sort of central repository of dead memory, right? Um, whereas what exists in our minds is living memory. And we should distinguish very carefully between these two things. So I think us moderns are suffering and the children born over the past 15 or 20 years, many of them will never know what it means to develop a highly sophisticated memory and relationship with their own memory. I think, I think it's being damaged by its replacement, um, which as I said, is not alive has not come to life. Now the darkness here is coming. <laughs> and some of you <laughs> who are not now listening are probably already dreaming. And the water of dreaming is flowing into the rivers of memory, restructuring, washing, inviting, creating. There is something sacred and divine about all of these matters. When the brightness of the sun in the day stops declaring the identity and shape and color of beings, then the imagination comes forth to suggest and paint and play and respond to the events of the day the events of our lifetime and perhaps the potentials of the future. I've deeply enjoyed this chance to reflect on memory and dreaming, consciousness and imagination with you. And I want to return to the idea that the living world and the living beings and places of the world can be understood as the living embodiments of the memory and origin of life and consciousness not just on earth, but in time space itself. And that fills me with awe and love and wonder and reverence and ecstasy and joy. I adore this living world. And I long to deeply understand our peculiar human contribution and ability I wish you all a happy solstice night a joyful coming time but most of all, I wish wonder in your memory, in your dreaming, in your relations. May life and time be kind and gentle with you.
May your holidays bring you insight and joy.